so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of the land we have recorded this podcast on, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. I'm gonna start a fire. It's another dry February day in Florida in 2009 and 26-year-old Heather Strong is on shift at a diner at a local truck stop. She's a waitress there, a hard-working mother of two young kids who's well-loved by her colleagues. She's been with her husband 11 years, married just two months, but they've recently separated. It's well known that their relationship is very on and off and that he's abusive and controlling. While she's busy at work, he calls. Her colleagues notice she's clearly upset. I just need to get away from him and keep the kids away from him, she tells them. It's one of their final interactions with Heather. After that shift, they never see her again. And when police start to investigate her disappearance, it's not just her husband, Josh, who becomes their prime suspect. His girlfriend, Amelia, who is eight months pregnant with his child, is also interrogated for answers. What they'll uncover is a crime so horrible, it will see Amelia become the youngest Florida woman to be sentenced to death for a crime she now says she had nothing to do with. I'm Gemma Barf, and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is about Heather Strong and the people responsible for her disappearance. Joining me to discuss this case is podcast host and former radio presenter Jack Lawrence. Jack spent the past four years speaking with inmates from the US prison system about their convictions as part of a podcast project called One Minute Remaining. In this time, he's had multiple conversations with Amelia Carr, who's now serving two life sentences for the murder and kidnapping of Heather Strong. And just before we get into this conversation, Please know that there is a brief description of a very graphic, violent act, as well as mentions of sexual assault. Set the scene for us, Jack. Marion County, Florida. Mm. What's that part of the world like? From everything I've learned over the last four years, it is um, one hell of a town, that's for sure. As a number of the inmates who I talk to, men and women, say, uh, you don't want to visit Florida in general because of their legal system. Obviously, they're not a fan of the legal system because they found themselves on the wrong side of it. But yeah, Marion County is a fascinating place and it's made even fascinating if you just look up the sheriff of the area. His name is Sheriff Grady Judd, quite an interesting character himself and apparently has bobbleheads that he signs and gives out to people. So uh, yeah, it's a very interesting place. A hell of a lot goes down in Marion County. Apparently, one lady I spoke to said it's one of the most dangerous towns in America. So Wow. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, today we're talking about what happened there in February 2009. Mm -hmm. A woman named Heather Strong went missing. What was her story? So she was originally from Mississippi. She was in a relationship with a guy called Joshua Fulgham and she had two kids by him and they'd only recently moved to Marin County as I said, from Mississippi, and they had a very tumultuous relationship, very on again, off again, and she would find herself traveling sort of backward and forward between Florida and Mississippi. So yeah, she was a hardworking mum. You know, she worked in a truck stop as a waitress. From everything I, I've gathered and from everyone I've spoken to, just a hardworking mum, loved the kids, and just found herself in a dodgy relationship, to say the least. Yeah, those who loved her, how would they describe the relationship between her and her estranged husband, Josh? Not great is an understatement. There was many occasions where she would uh, call the police on Josh because he wasn't a nice human being. Yeah, there was a lot of fights happening, but I think it's a sad situation in a lot of these cases where 
people find themselves in abusive relationships where they can't be with them and they can't be without them for some strange reason. They feel this connection to this person and she always found herself being drawn back to Josh because although he was abusive, obviously it's one of those things where, you know, he was abusive one minute then, oh, you know, come back, let's make this work. So it was just not a great situation, again, to say the least. And just before she went missing, she had broken up with him again? Yeah, so this was um, this was a fascinating thing. So it was about, I believe, from memory, 10 days prior to her going missing, in fact, Joshua was in jail. So he was in jail because he'd pulled a shotgun on her and threatened her with a shotgun. So she obviously called police and he was then arrested and found himself in jail for that. And there's actually quite a chilling phone conversation where you can hear Heather and him talking and he's basically saying, what are you doing? Drop the charges. Hello? Hey, please don't hang up. I'm not. Heather, why do you do this? You promised me. You promised me I can't live like this. Well, are you going to push this or what? Mm-hmm. Huh? You're not going to do that, John. You're going to kill me when you get out there. About two weeks later, she went missing. So she went missing two weeks after that phone call, but when was she actually reported missing or discovered missing? So she wasn't reported missing until March 18 and she went missing on Feb 15. So she wasn't reported missing for, well, pretty much well over a month. She stopped turning up to work uh, and that's when people started getting a little bit concerned about where she was. Her husband was telling people that she decided that she needed just to get away and she wanted a break and she was leaving the kids with him. And that's when sort of alarm bells started to ring because a lot of people, especially at the place where she worked, in fact, the last time she was seen at work, the people she worked with said that uh, she took a phone call from Josh and she seemed very upset. In fact, she'd already told people at work that she needed to get away from him and she wanted to get the kids away from him. So obviously police started looking into this and it was soon discovered that Josh was seeing another woman Mm -hmm. by the name of Amelia Carr. How long had that been going on for? So it was an on-again, off-again relationship. Now, obviously, I talked to Amelia Carr and spoke to her this morning, and uh, she's told me repeatedly that the area where they were, there was a very small group of people, and they sort of did a lot of relationship swapping, shall we say. And she met Josh when a friend of her ex-partner's passed away. So she met Josh at her ex-partner's house, and they started getting along and, and chatting and he would drop by her work and conversations would sort of flow. So whenever he was on a break with Heather, he seemed to then gravitate towards Amelia. And Amelia says that the relationship in her mind was never a serious relationship. It was more of a fling. Did Heather know about this situation that was happening? Yep. So Amelia says that she was well aware of the situation and Amelia says that they were actually quite good friends and they got quite close over sort of, you know, bonding over the fact Josh was this not nice human being, and but he seemed to have this pull over these women because they always seemed to end up with him at some point. So yeah, so the relationship would sort of jump between, but she said there was no animosity between either of them. She said, you know, that they actually were quite good friends and, you know, they both had kids and they were both loving mothers. So they also bonded over that. But obviously we don't have Heather's side of that story. No. So who was Amelia in 2009? What was her story? Yeah, wow. So Amelia, uh, if we go a bit back, I mean, Amelia's story growing up was a a horrendous story. And from a very young age, she came from an abusive household. Her father was Cuban. And she says that um, growing up in that household, her father was very much women should be seen and not heard. And uh, he was not a nice human being. In fact, he was abusive towards her sexually abusive towards her from a young age. In fact, she said she was abused from the age of four all the way to the age of 15 where she finally spoke up and she told a counsellor about the abuse at the age of 15 to which her father at the time was then arrested and sent to prison. She was taken away from the family and her and her sister were put into care and they spent about a year in care because Amelia says that her mother, even on finding out about the abuse, found a way to still sort of remain with her father Mm. which obviously is a horrendous situation. To make it even worse, after Amelia returned to her mum's house from care, they found out that her father was trying to arrange the murder of her, her mother and her grandmother from prison in order to have them killed so that they wouldn't testify against him regarding the abuse. So Amelia had, to say the least, a hell of a shocking upbringing. She had two kids by the age of 19, her first child at 16, even that is an, in, in, a, a very strange situation because she was still 
technically within the care of the state at the age of 16. She was in the process of being returned to her mother and she met a guy who was six years older than her. He was 22 and um, she fell pregnant to him. Now the state turned around, apparently, this is what she tells me, that they turned around and said, well, you guys need to get married or your partner is going to do jail time. That sounds strange. Very strange. And that's what I said to her. I said, this sounds bizarre. I mean, like, surely it makes no difference whether you're married or not married. Abuse is abuse and the law is the law. But she says that in their eyes, she, and that's what she said, Marion County and that area is, you know, the laws are, are bizarre. But she says that um, essentially if they get married, that's her parents essentially agreeing to the relationship and that it's okay. So they were essentially forced to get married, she says. Mm. It's when she was 16 and he was 22. But, yeah, so they had two kids together. They spent five years together and then got divorced. She got into another relationship. And this is the important thing, the fact that she jumped from relationship to relationship because this whole scenario was built as a, a love triangle and that she wanted Josh all to herself. And she says that she just wasn't like that. She says actually she's done research since she's been in prison about abuse and, and what that can cause. And she said that she feels that because of the abuse she was subjected to made her quite promiscuous, as she says, when she was younger. So she wasn't interested in these long relationships or these heavy relationships. She says that it's just not something that she was into. So by the time she met Josh, she had three children. She'd been in multiple relationships. She'd been married. And then she met Josh and they started a relationship. And then she actually ended up becoming pregnant to him as well. And she's pregnant when this kind of all goes down, isn't she? Eight months pregnant, yeah. So obviously Amelia is dragged into the police station and interrogated as part of this. How did she yep. react initially to that? So initially it's all shock. You know, she's playing, she doesn't know what's going on. She didn't know that Heather had gone missing. She has no idea. And she said she went in there quite happily to answer their questions and try and help with the finding of Heather. And she said she was first put on guard where the main sheriff who was investigating it said to her, you know, how far along are you? And she said, eight months. And he said, well, you want to see that baby born, don't you? And she said from that moment on, she knew that things were not great and she was on guard. But it carried on for, you know, she would be sort of interrogated and left in that room till about two, three o'clock in the morning. Then they would take her home. And then 45 minutes to an hour later, they'd be back at her door, knocking on the door and taking her back in for more questioning. And that went on for a few days. And for a few days, you know, she continued on saying, look, I have no idea what's going on. I don't know where Heather is and that sort of stuff. And her and Josh were basically in there at the same time. Obviously, he's in one room, she's in the other. And then the sheriffs are basically going from one room to the next and trying to sort of play them off against each other. Pretty early on in the investigation, they discover that Heather's debit card has been used and they kind of link yeah. Josh to that. So they've got Josh mm -hmm. in their sights pretty early on, don't yeah. they? Oh, 100%. I mean, that was his biggest mistake that he made to start with, really, was he went in and they asked him about her card, Heather's card. Oh, what's happening with Heather's card? Have you been using it? And he said, no, I, I haven't used the card. Because, I mean, he was her husband at that stage. They got married. He was her husband. So, you know, if you're in a relationship, I use my wife's card. Sometimes she'll use my card. Yeah. So there's no – he could have had a very good reason to be using that card, but he chose to lie and say, no, no, I haven't used her card, not at all. But they had him on CCTV using her card. So then – the sheriff turns around and said, I know you've used it. We've got you on CCTV using it. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wait, hold on a second. Let me think about that. Oh, no, actually, you're right. No, I do remember using it. So that's, and then straight away, they're obviously their ears are pricked and they're like, okay, he's already lying about this. What else is he lying about? And he denies having anything to do with Heather's disappearance? 100%. His first, uh, what he's saying to them to start with is that she decided she'd had enough and she wanted to go away. So he's sticking to that story that she has just decided to leave and she said she'll be back soon and that he doesn't know where she's gone. He doesn't know anything. It's all very much no idea. I don't know what's going on. She left me with the kids. In fact, he had a, this is another mistake he made, he presented them with a piece of paper which was typed up supposedly from Heather that she said that she wanted to leave the kids in the custody of him and she needed time away. And then there was just this scribbled sort of signature so the police, again, instantly said to him, why is this typed up? Why didn't she write it out? And he's like, oh, we thought it would look more professional if, you know, it was typed up. And they said, but you know that we do, you know, handwriting recognition and stuff like that. So it just seems weird that it would be typed up. But then he still stayed down the track of, well, no, she's left. She didn't want to be here. But from what we know about Heather, would she ever leave her kids behind? No, 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 100% never. In fact, she, well, as all the family and friends say, she was planning to take the kids away from him. And that's essentially one of the main issues of why what happened happened was because she told him she was taking the kids away from him essentially and, you know, he wasn't going to let that happen. Eventually after 
you know, days of interrogation, he does crack. What does he tell them? It's actually quite incredible. You can watch the moment that this happens and it sends a bit of a chill down your spine because, first of all, before he cracks, he tries to put the blame on Amelia, solely Amelia, saying that, you know, oh, she said to me that, oh, it's been handled, don't worry about it. They stay on that for a little while and eventually they really have nothing on Amelia. All they've got on Josh is this using of the credit card unlawfully. So they decided to place him under arrest for that so they could at least keep him, but they send Amelia home. So as the detective walks in or the sheriff walks in to take all Josh's stuff and get ready to process him to put him in jail, he comes into the room and says, okay, I need all your bits and pieces. And Josh is like, I'm going to jail. And he goes, yep, you're going to jail. You know, that's where you want to go. And he's like, well, that's not where I want to go. He's like, well, you know, that's what's happening. And as they're putting this stuff in the bag, he says to him, can I see my mum? And the detective says, you want to call her? He goes, no, no, I want to see my mum. He said, you, you let me see my mum and I'll take you to Heather. Wow. It's chilling. Honestly, it's chilling. And then the detective, as he says, he could show no emotion and he was like it nearly fell over. And he said, look, you take me to Heather, then we'll take you to your mum. And they literally chucked him in the car straight away and drove him to where he said Heather was. And all the way through in the car ride, they've got audio recordings of him in the car. He was still putting the blame solely on Amelia. So he does do what he says. He takes police to Heather's body. Where is her Mm. final resting place? Well, this is uh, where things obviously go terribly for Amelia because Heather is found buried essentially in Amelia's backyard where she's living next to a a trailer where they store bits and pieces in the trailer and she's found sadly in a shallow grave in Amelia's backyard. Obviously that question is then put to Amelia. Yeah, they've knocked on the door and they've taken her straight in. But this is where it gets all sort of very confusing because obviously now things are getting more serious. Mm. The body's now been found in her backyard. So then she starts to say, you know what, he was round at my place and then he knocked on my window at 5 a.m. one morning and said, oh, look, just don't go out the back, you know, just keep your mother out from out of the back and stay out of the back. The story starts to unravel and she tells him a bit more and more about, uh, well, I I did go out there and, and I found Heather in the trailer and she'd been duct taped to this chair and she said, "I, you know, I freaked out because I walked in there and she was unconscious and I felt for a pulse and and there was no pulse and she said I waited till he got home and I confronted him about it. But essentially they still didn't really have anything on Amelia. Obviously Josh had the history of violence against Heather. He'd been lying from the start. So they had a bit more of a case against him they didn't really have much on her apart from his word against her because he's saying you know oh she had involvement in it so yeah so this is where things kind of start to unravel essentially yeah so they've got this you know confession they've got a body how do they end up implicating Amelia into the crime well they don't actually have a confession as yet so Josh hasn't yet confessed to anything he's still pushing the fact that Amelia's involved it's he said she said situation until one day where Josh says he wants to talk to the main detective. So he's pulled in and he essentially unloads. He admits to the crime. He talks them through how it happened, how Amelia helped him with it, how they lured Heather to that particular place and how the actual murder took place. So he's then obviously sent back to jail and for some reason Amelia calls, well, I mean, the detectives say she calls Josh's sister because detectives say that she wanted to find out what was going on and what Josh was saying essentially to the detectives. So Josh's family is quite angry to say the least that he's the only one going down for this when they believe she's involved as well. So Josh's sister then phones the detectives and says, Amelia's called me, she's asking questions about what's happening and what's going on. So then they ask Josh's sister to wear a wire and to record a conversation that she has with Amelia. She then picks up Amelia in a car. They go for a drive and detectives are listening to this conversation and following them at the time. And Amelia starts to basically tell Josh's sister details of the crime and what happened. So what is he going to do now? He confesses to this. We both don't know. We both lose our kids. Tell me what happened that night because three heads are better than two. Yeah. She tried to run for the door. And she knocked me down. He tried to back. And he started to take her to the chair. It is a very gruesome detail of what happened, mm. but can you take us through an overview of what she told the sister? 
Sure. So essentially what happened with this is I, I've got to say that Amelia has said after all this that it was a false confession essentially. But what Josh said happened and how that played out, he said that uh, essentially they lured Heather to Amelia's house. Now Josh told Heather that Amelia had some money hidden in this particular trailer and that he was going to take it from her and then they were going to leave. So he was going to rob her essentially. So she apparently goes ahead with this and they go to Amelia's place and then they go out to the back trailer. Once they get out to the back trailer, Heather's looking around the trailer apparently for this money which isn't there and then Josh just says to her, look, Heather, I'm really sorry. She then realises that something's not right and she says, I need to leave. And he says, no, I need to talk to you. You need to talk to me. You know, you sit down, points to a chair, tells her to sit down. So she goes to leave and he stops her from leaving. And as she's trying to leave, Amelia then apparently then comes out to the back of the trailer because she's in on this whole thing apparently. So they then force her into this chair that's out there. Josh says that he sits on her to make sure she can't get out of the chair. He says that um, Heather is then duct taped to that chair by the arms. He says that he was talking to Heather and Amelia had told Josh that Heather had slept with a friend of theirs two days after he went to jail for the shotgun incident and he said, did this happen? She says it did and he said that's when he completely lost it. He didn't care anymore. So he's sitting on her, she's duct taped to the chair and then he says that Amelia places a bag over the top of Heather's head. At this stage she's got a mouth duct taped as well so her mouth is duct taped She's duct taped to the chair. Amelia puts a bag over her head. Now, he says that Amelia tries to break Heather's neck, but she's not strong enough to do it. She tries twice to do it, he says, but it doesn't work. So eventually she just uses the plastic bag over the head, holds Heather's nose closed, and essentially he sits on her and she suffocates Heather until Heather doesn't essentially move anymore and she passes away. They then obviously remove all items that they've used to commit the crime and uh, she's then buried in the backyard in a large black duffel bag. It's horrendous. It's horrendous. That What a horrible way to die. And that's essentially why, you know, eventually Amelia would be sentenced to death because of how horrendous it was. In that phone conversation in the car, does Amelia admit initially to trying to break the neck and then trying to suffocate her? She does. She actually does say in the, in the recordings. Now, I haven't yet got to this point with Amelia in our conversation as to her reasoning behind what she said in that car. So I don't know mm. why she said what she said, but she does say, you can hear her say that she did try and break her neck. But again, I haven't heard the whole conversation. I've heard that part of it. But yeah, so I mean, at this stage, I don't know what Amelia's answer is to why she said that, but I, I will hopefully find that out soon. Did they ever find any physical evidence to corroborate what the pair said happened in the trailer? There was no physical evidence, as far as I know, to tie her to the scene, which is, again, you know, why they couldn't really arrest her because they had nothing on her. And they had nothing on Josh really to do with the murder until, of course, he confessed to it. They just arrested him on that, the unlawful use of Heather's car. That's how they arrested him and kept him in prison, but they had to send her home even though he was implicating her in, you know, having something to do with it because prior to the confession he was just suggesting that Amelia knew more than what she was letting on. But it was a he said, she said, so they couldn't arrest her on that, but they arrested him on the credit card charge or the, the card charge. All they did find was an empty roll of duct tape, so like the inside part of the duct tape because yeah. essentially they apparently used the entire roll. But they did say that they disposed of everything that could link them police-wise. So the duct tape was gone, the bag was gone, everything. The chair was still there, strangely enough, but uh, everything else was was gone and then she was just found in the duffel bag. So, But I don't believe there's no DNA evidence that links Amelia to this crime at all. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with podcast host Jack Lawrence about Amelia Carr, the once youngest woman on death row in Florida. So Amelia and Josh were charged with murder. Mm. How did Amelia's trial go? So she was tried first and she pleaded innocent because she said that it was a coerced confession because she eventually was taken back and she was, you know, basically said, look, we've got this recording of you telling Josh's sister exactly what happened. We've got you on recording. And that's when she broke and she started talking. She, she essentially told them exactly the same story as what Josh had told them, but the difference was, she implicated Josh as the one that killed Heather, not her. And she says that 
it was a false confession. And, and the reason she gives for the fact that she could basically essentially repeat Josh's story verbatim was because she says that detectives were actually feeding her that information off camera. She said they spoke to her in, in different rooms and were saying, look, we want this guy. We desperately want to get this guy. So you need to give us a story that will help us lock him away. So she says that they were feeding her information about the killing and what he had told them, what he admitted to, so that then she could essentially corroborate that story but then not implicate herself by saying, but I didn't have anything to do with this. I am confused as to how she's saying it's a coerced confession when she didn't know that there was a wire when she was talking to Josh's sister. And that's the interesting thing and that's where I'm confused as well and that's why I'm, I'm looking forward to questioning her on that particular part and finding out if it was a coerced confession, then how? what were the details as to giving that information to Josh's sister in the car? So as I said, yeah, I'm not sure what her answer to that is yet, but I have no doubt there will be one. So the jury only took two hours to decide on her guilty verdict and yeah. she, as you mentioned just earlier, was sentenced to death. Yeah. Can you take us through what the death penalty looks like in Florida? Yeah, so it's uh, death by lethal injection. At the time, she was the youngest woman to be sentenced to death and only the third actual woman to be on death row. She hasn't talked me through the whole sitting in death row section, which I know she desperately wants to talk about that because she said it's one of the most inhumane places to put someone. So, yeah, so they're essentially sentenced to death, but there's a lot of appeal processes to go through before you get anywhere near that needle. There are people in there that choose not to appeal, but most of them do, obviously. And uh, she went through the appeal process and in 2017 she actually had her charges downgraded I say downgraded. I mean, she was taken off the death penalty and, and given two life sentences. But death penalty, when you have been sentenced to the death penalty, you can often sit on that for your whole natural life, can't you? Oh, yeah. I mean, some people actually have died of old age before they even get to that point because I said, yeah, there's a lot of legal processes to go through and appeals before you get anywhere near that. Even when you get towards the date of your execution or the death penalty, you know, there's even more appeals and things you can ask for clemency and things like that. So, yeah, so people can sit on death row for, yeah, they can actually die from natural causes before they even get put to death. But the people on death row obviously don't have the privileges that people in normal jails do. I mean, Amelia in her situation now, I mean, she's in quite a, I don't want to use the word comfortable, but reasonably for a jail situation and reasonably comfortable situation where they have TVs and, you know, access to sort of notepads and, and like iPads, but, you know, they can send emails and bits and pieces. So, Whereas from what you know about what death row inmates have to go through, are they just kind of held in like a solitary situation? Like what do we know? Yeah. Yeah, they're, and they're locked up for 23 out of 24 hours a day. Right. And, uh, yeah, essentially have all their meals and everything brought to them. And, uh, yeah, they're confined to their cells indefinitely until – you know, such time as either that death penalty comes through or they have their charges downgraded or they pass away. If you plead guilty to the crimes, can mm. you avoid the death penalty? Yeah, so that's what happened to Josh Fulgham. So he pleaded guilty to the crime and he avoided the death penalty. But because Amelia said that she was not going to plead guilty, she got a, a harsher sentence. So he essentially took what they call a plea deal or plea bargain. So they came to him and said, you know, okay, well, you plead guilty to this on the day in court and, uh, you know, you'll get life. We won't request the death penalty, essentially. Life can mean different things in different countries mm. as to how long you spend in prison. What is it for them? So in, in Florida, there is a hell of a lot of people, actually, that, that end up in jail and uh, they get sentences. So there's a guy I'm talking to who's got 100 years. Wow. Yeah. But Florida is a place where there's a, no, it's a majority no parole system. So they get these sentences, so 30, 40 years. So I'm talking to a lady called Doris Moore. She's in jail for murder and she got 32 years without the possibility of parole. So essentially at the age she is, it's a life sentence. Yeah. So And, and most of these people do get these sentences where it's no parole sentences. So it's a case of you get this time in prison and that's it. So there's another lady I'm talking to who's in jail for a double murder and she's got 48 years with no parole. So essentially, again, that's a life sentence for her. She'll die in prison. Given that you have just touched on a few of the other people you have been talking to, what have you learnt talking to all of these people? Do they have any similarities or similar experiences? Yeah, I, look, I, I've noticed that the majority of them had some trauma in their sort of younger life growing up. Not all of them, but the majority of them had some major trauma or, or something happened in their life. Drugs is a major factor in a number of the cases that, are, that I'm dealing with. Yeah, it's an interesting one because... 
these people that I talk to, the majority of them, 90% of them are in for horrific crimes. Yeah. But they, talking to them, I find myself, because someone said to me like, oh, do you consider them friends? And I'm like, well, one lady I've been talking to for four and a half years, Doris Moore, Mm. and we chat regularly and she's a lovely person. I mean, I don't know whether I'm getting sucked in. (laughs) Well, what was her crime? uh, So she was arrested for murder, the murder of a guy called Abraham Lee Shakespeare who won $30 million in in the uh, Florida lottery and she was uh, accused of his murder to take his basically lottery winnings. But she's always, again, denied committing that crime and she's been fighting for her release for the last 12 years uh, and recently just got a new evidentiary hearing based off some DNA evidence. I mean, your crime isn't the only part of your personality, so I have no doubt that these people can be you know, really lovely Mm. (laughs) in other aspects of their life. What's Amelia like in terms of when you have chats with her? What's her personality like? She's very reserved, Amelia. It's funny that I've got some inmates that I talk to who are just, we just have a great chat and a a bit of a laugh and, you know, it's a bit of fun. But Amelia is like, even I I had to listen ahead of this interview with yourself, I had to listen back to actually our first chat. And um, like as someone who's been interviewing people for the last 14 years, is, you know, you, you do those interviews where you ask a question and you get that one word response and then you're like, okay. Yep. <laughs> make some out of this. <laughs> so she was very much, she's warmed up to me now, but I think especially a lot of these people like, so Amelia's case obviously was highly publicized in the media. Doris's case, highly publicized in the media. So they're very wary of people like myself who's come to them and say, I want to tell your story. You know, so she, Amelia was very sheepish with me to start. She's still, you know, she's wary of me, I think still. But uh, yeah, she's, she's warming to me. But she seems, again, like a, just a normal person that you would talk to any day of the week. But I suppose, you know, these people are generally, you know, I suppose as we say, they've got some reasonably good characteristics. But How many conversations have you had with Amelia? When did you first meet her? Uh, so I was introduced to Amelia about three months ago by Doris. Doris was my the first lady I spoke to four years ago, and she's essentially introduced me to all these other women that I talk to. So yeah, so we've spoken, I believe, five times now, and we get half an hour to chat each time we call. So about two and a half hours we've spoken to so far. So we've got a few more chats to have. As I said, I don't know why she said what she said in that car, and she wants to talk to me about the death row situation and all that sort of stuff. So we've got a few more chats to have. But uh, we also communicate via email. I mean, I get it via email, but they get it on a little, like a computer pad. And we converse quite regularly, you know, probably once a week via message just to sort of see how they're going and just a general chit chat. I think, you know, obviously being in the situation they're in to have someone else to talk to outside of the prison walls, they kind of enjoy that sort of interaction. What's her main message been to you so far? She still says that she's innocent in this. Yeah, 110%. She says she's innocent and um, essentially the reason she agreed to do what she's doing with me is because I've said to her, look, and I say this with all the inmates I talk to, my role is not to try and prove you innocent or guilty. My role is to let you tell your story and I won't edit it, won't change anything, I won't skew it a different way. And that's essentially what she wants. She wants to be able to tell her story and tell what happened because you look at the documentaries and documentaries have been made about her and Doris and all these other people and, and they're quite heavily focused on, well, these guys are killers, they did it and, you know, they're evil people. So her message is that she wants to get out is the lies that she says have been told by these documentaries that, you know, it's a love triangle and she wanted Heather gone to have Josh all to herself and, you know, she wanted to marry Josh and run away with him and be happily ever after and this sort of stuff. So she said her main message is that's just not the case, you know, that Heather was her friend, you know, essentially she's just not guilty. She wants to get that message out that she's not guilty and she's still fighting to get back into court and to try and get released. Is she saying that she wasn't there at all? Yeah, she's saying she wasn't there at all. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Which has confused me at the very It's start. so confusing. Yeah, no, trust me. <laughs> Try and turn these things into podcasts so that people listening don't get confused. <laughs> I'm listening. I go, I'm confused. I am, you know, and I think the listeners will be intrigued as well. When you do have conversations with people and, you know, as many conversations as you're having, yeah. it's hard not to be sympathetic to them oh, because totally. they're the person you're talking to. Yeah. Have you found yourself getting sucked into that and trying to stay backwards from it? 110%. Yeah, there's things they tell me and I, I'm going, I, I just like this lady I'm talking to, Kimberly Boone, who's in jail for attempted murder and arson on her husband. She was telling me that these two fire marshals ruled the fire as, a, as an accident. But then when detectives called one of them and said, oh, look, we've arrested her for attempted murder, are you sure that fire was an accident? And he decided to change his 
ruling to suspicious. Well, I find myself going, Kim, I don't, this is insane. I, and I'm like, <laughs> now I'm rooting for it. And I'm just like, am I getting sucked in? Or am I, yeah. you know, but, but there's actually genuine people like the guy, the 100 year guy, David Talley. He is less like, it's like talking to my dad on the phone. I really, I'm, I'm like, he's got me. And he's not killed anyone, so that's fine. He didn't kill anyone <laughs> and he's not claiming to be innocent. You know, he was just in a bad situation, drugs again, and he just was dealt a horrendous blow. I mean, there's a lawyer that I have on the podcast who comes on and chat with me and I briefly mentioned his situation to the lawyer and the lawyer's just like shaking his head. You know, I, I speak to David's son and his sister on a regular basis as well. I'm like part of the family now. So, yeah, I do, I'm getting totally sucked into a lot of these people. Even And Doris, you know, you know, Doris and I chat regularly and, our relationship sort of is this up and down roller coaster because, you know, the small things in that in prison become huge things. And then I get embroiled in those things and get pulled in. And we have people on the outside telling them, oh, he said this on social media. And, and I'm like, guys, I didn't say that. And it's just, <laughs> it's a weird world I'm in at the moment. It sounds like a very weird world. Have you spoke to anyone else in Amelia's circles? Have you spoken to Josh? Have you heard what his side of this is? No, I would like to contact Josh. See, what I found is the men don't really want to tell their stories. I'm speaking to three men. I've spoken to two on the phone and getting their stories, David Talley and this other guy who got involved with the Mexican mafia. I spoke to those two and I've got another guy who I'm sort of on the hook and, and trying to get him, convince him to chat with me. But the guys tend to just not want to bother chatting about the stories. I've said to the other gentleman I'm talking to, hey, do you know anyone else in there would love to tell their story? And they're just like, guys, just don't talk. Mm. You know, I've sent other messages to other male inmates to ask, you know, would you like to come in and have a chat with us? And they just don't respond. So Josh, I will contact Josh. It's it's, it's very hard to sometimes find these guys. It, you know, have to do a hell of a lot of digging because you need their inmate number and that's not readily available. And But yes, I, I will contact Josh. I haven't spoken to, I'm trying not to talk to the families in these situations because I don't want to upset them. Mm. Now, I know that it's probably a weird thing to say when I'm doing these interviews and we're talking about these very personal moments, but, you know, I try to avoid gruesome details as to these crimes. So when we talk about Amelia's case, I'm going to avoid talking about the gruesome details as to what actually happened. So, yeah, so I don't really want to be going down the lines of contacting Heather's mother or brother because I just, I just don't feel right about doing that. I don't know, maybe, you know, I've contacted some detectives and bits and pieces involved in these cases because I think it's important to try and get the other side of the story. But that's the other thing, as I said, with most of the documentaries made about these people and a lot of them have had stories made about them, the detectives have said all the what they have to say about the case. Their side of the story is well and truly out there. You know, it's been told multiple times, many, many times over. Like Doris Moore, I think she's had four documentaries made about her. And it's all obviously skewed to the detective side and, yeah, they have detectives on there. They have the guy that caught her in, a, you know, recordings and telling their story. So that's, again, why I do what I'm doing because, you know, as I said, I'm not trying to prove these guys innocent. I'm not here to say, oh, you know, they didn't do it. Look at this. Look at this evidence. Look at that evidence. It's simply just to let them tell their story, get it out there. We talk about the case. We talk about the, you know, what the prosecution said that they did and, and that sort of stuff. And then I allow them to, to rebut and say, well, you know, no, this is actually what happened and, and go down that route. So essentially, I mean, I think Josh would be interesting if I could get Josh to chat because Amelia says that he's actually since written an affidavit to say that she was not involved in the crime whatsoever. Do you think that there is more to Amelia's story given all of the evidence that there is against her? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky one because, you, again, the, the thing that's got me at the moment is exactly the same thing that got you, that car. It's very tough to win these inmates too because things happen and it goes weeks and we can't talk. So I haven't had a chance to get to that point yet because we just keep getting cut off. But that's the one thing that's bothering me about this particular case is that conversation in that car. If that conversation hadn't happened in that car, I could sort of see her side of it and I could, you know, say, well, that's plausible. It's like Doris Moore's story. Listen to Doris Moore's story. It is insane. It is crazy. It's just like when I first heard it, I'm like, you are, you've made this up in your head. And then I started getting bits of information and some recordings that I'd never heard before and I'm like, you know what? This is plausible. So with Amelia, uh, yeah, it's for me it's that. There's always one thing in these cases when I'm talking to these different people that makes me go, ah, that's just bothering me. And the conversation in the car is bothering me. The thing that stayed with me after looking at this case and this story is the children involved. Yeah. There's a lot of young kids involved. Mm -hmm. Amelia has, you know, four. Do we know what happened to her children? Uh, they went into the care of the state. 
and essentially that's also why she decided just to, you know, blurt out as well as much as she could and, and, you know, try and get herself out of trouble was because they were taken by the state. So, and she'd been through that system and she knows what it's like and, and that's when she started to panic. So as far as I'm aware, that's where they ended up within the care of the state. So she, yeah, so she had four children. Josh obviously had two children with Heather. They mm. went to Heather's family to be raised in Mississippi with Heather's family. And that's the sad thing in, in a lot of these cases. It's just like there's always children. There's, there's literally always children involved. You know, the Kimberly Boone story, her children were four and eight when she was arrested. She hasn't seen them, heard from them, spoken to them for 14 years. So mm. I'm not here to prove her innocent or guilty, but those children were well and truly innocent. And on one night they lost their mother like, like that, gone. So, yeah, it's horrendous and uh, you do, as a, as a father of two small children, like I'm just like I cannot comprehend some of this stuff that, that I hear when the kids are involved. Heather's children would be, I did my math, about 15 and early 20s. Mm. So, you know, they're watching all of this unravel and they barely would have known their mother. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, you've got the eight-month-old, you know, mm. wouldn't even had no memories at all of her mother or his mother. So, yeah, it's, it's horrible. It's a horrible situation. Any lasting thoughts about this case that you think listeners would be intrigued to know? Just because for me and you, there is still a lot of confusion here as to why she is trying to prove her innocence. But what do you want listeners to get out of hearing her story? I think it's just that, hearing her story and hearing what she has to say. I mean, obviously people will make up their own mind as to the guilt or innocence. I know, you know, I put little snippets out there on social media and people instantly go, guilty. Don't believe it. <laughs> Rubbish. And you go, okay, well, that's your opinion. But I think even, you know, I keep going back to the Doris Moore case because it's sim- it's it's like Amelia's case. It's confusing. There's a lot of twists and turns and it's so funny. You see people at the very start go, well, she's talking rubbish. She's guilty. And then by the end they're like, hold on a second. No, 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 no. There's And yeah, and it's funny how people, you know, it's like any of these making a murder and stuff, these shows and, you know, serial and things like that, you listen to them, you, your mind changes constantly as to guilt, innocence, guilt, innocence. And I think with Amelia's case, you know, I think it's sad, unfortunately. It's a, it's a sad situation. And, again, I, I just want to allow her, I suppose, to be able to tell her side of the story because she says she's innocent. People, you know, the, 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 the law in the U.S. says she's guilty. But it's been proven time and time again that there are a number of people locked up in our prison systems or the US prison system who are innocent of the crimes they've committed. I mean, as we know, Adnan Saeed has just been, you know, found not guilty, had his charges gone and he spent 22 or 23 years in jail and a lot of people believing him to be a murderer. So, you know, it's not beyond the realms of possibility that these people I'm talking to, you know, I know a lot of people, I talk to people and they're like, oh, I've got another person who says they're innocent, do you? And it's no guilty (laughs) people in prison. But, you know, that's the thing. It's just, I just, as I said, I just want to allow them to tell their stories and people can make up their own mind as to the innocence or guilt, I suppose. Thanks to Jack for assisting us to tell this story. His podcast, One Minute Remaining, which features first-hand interviews with Amelia Carr and other inmates from the US prison system, is linked in our show notes if you'd like to take a listen. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, with audio design by Rhiannon Mooney. The executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you enjoyed this episode, let us know by leaving a rating or review in your favourite podcast app. It helps other true crime fans find our content and helps us keep making the episodes you get to enjoy every week. Thanks for listening and I'll be back next week with another true crime conversation.